Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Today is July 4th, a holiday in the United States. As is the custom of our church, over the centuries, many such holidays have been co-opted to serve the gospel of Jesus Christ. In this spirit, on this day, we at the Bible as Literature remember all those in peril the many refugees fleeing poverty and violence and their fallen brothers and sisters. We implore God on their behalf to grant them shelter and refuge through his teaching in fulfillment of his promise that whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink. Truly, I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 285 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We continue with Matthew chapter 10. We're going into the last three verses, Richard. And the writer continues with these beautiful parallelisms. Earlier in the chapter, Matthew draws a comparison between disciple teacher and slave master. And the same thing is happening here, but we're shifting gears now in verse 40 with the first example to the special relationship, if I can use that phrase, between Jesus and his Father. The human mind must change so that it no longer sees earthly honor as the goal, but sees godly honor as the goal, meaning obedience and subservience to God. True honor is honoring your commitment to God's teaching. Are you worthy of the time and effort and the blood spilt so that you could receive this teaching? This whole text is trying to prepare the disciples so that they're going out and they're able to see that it's only about the teaching. It's only about God's glory. It's not about being accepted by people or this village or this magistrate or this judge or this rabbi. It's simply being faithful to this teaching and being faithful to the one who taught it originally, which is not even Jesus, but Jesus's father. The goal must be the honor that cannot be seen with human eyes, but can only be heard through the listening and the attention to the teaching. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. This reminds me very much of the classic scenario where someone does something for another person and says to them, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this because of your dad. It's that kind of personal authority On the one hand, the text in this section of Matthew is discrediting family and tribe. But here in verse 40, it is going directly to the patriarch, the new patriarch who supplants family and tribe. And it is ascribing that personal authority, that impenetrable authority of the father figure in a nomadic setting to the father of Jesus and saying, look, If you take care of me, you're taking care of my father. It's like doing a favor to Don Corleone. He won't forget it. But of course, in Matthew, because everything is flipped on its head, as you said earlier, with respect to the teaching of the cross that Paul enumerates in 1 Corinthians, 
we know that doing a favor for the father of Jesus doesn't have the same type of reward as doing a favor for Caesar or Don Corleone. Right, Father. It reminds me of this wonderful tradition I witnessed when I was in Morocco. You're allowed to go and knock on anybody's door and ask them for something. If you need food, if you need a place to stay, that's assumed that you can do that. But if you knock on the door and say, na difallah, which means I am a guest of God, then they have to receive you. So if you invoke the name of God as a guest, the person who is opening the door, if they are a servant of God, must receive you because they're obedient to God. So interestingly, same person, but if they invoke, as you said, the patriarch of us all, then the one who is on the other side of the door must remain faithful. And so it does dismantle tribe because you're not accepting them because they're going to pay you money or they're going to give you prestige or your neighbors are going to see how generous you are or any of these sorts of things. It's only because you are a servant of God by receiving the disciple who was sent by Jesus, who was sent by his father, the one who ultimately sent them in order to teach. Don't forget, this is in the context of chapter 10. The person receives you because they respect the teaching. They respect the one who sent you. Like you were saying, I had the same happen to me after my father died. I met his friends from junior high school and high school for the first time. And they would tell me, Rich, if you need anything, you call me because I respected your dad, because I loved your dad. Your dad was a great guy. It didn't have to do with me. They never met me. But simply being the son of a respectable person, they were willing to do that. Now, that's what you do with your tribe. That's what you do with your people, with your neighborhood. But in this case, in Matthew chapter 10, you do it because of the father of Jesus Christ. The problem in this culture, of course, is that individuals believe that they are the center of their own universe. Well, they don't realize it's their universe, and they expect that everyone would treat them a certain way. So I find I have to reiterate this point often. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this because of my relationship with your parent. It's so beautiful and so honestly lacking because we all really believe in our own value. And that's the greatest fallacy of all. In Matthew, you're not valuable per se. No one is valuable simply by virtue of being. If you're just being, you're non-functional and you're not producing anything for the gospel. Your value in Matthew pertains to the Father who assigns a value to you alongside the sparrow. But if you think that the value pertains to you, then you're going to miss out on what Jesus is teaching in verse 40. You have a value because his father assigns value to you. You are not valuable. Again, I hearken to that classic expression. I'm not helping you. I'm helping you because of your father and what your father means to me. And now in verse 41, we have the first example in this section of the Matthaean parallelism. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Jesus, in his own words, is analogous to both a prophet and a righteous man. And he's talking about the reward for each. In Matthew, as you said earlier, we know what the prophet's reward is. We will hear it explained painfully in the woes against the scribes and Pharisees later in the book. The prophets were murdered. We know what the reward for a righteous man is in the Gospel of Matthew, because the story is about a righteous man who will be crucified by church and state. So, it's like the offer of a mob boss or a Caesar. You do get a reward, but the reward, because of the gospel, is flipped on its head. 
your reward in Matthew is in the heavens. It's interesting because it's not just receiving a prophet. It's receiving a prophet in the name of a prophet, meaning that you're giving recognition and glory to the prophet when you receive the prophet. Again, you're receiving that stranger in the name of God. So it's out of deference and out of respect and out of loyalty to God that you receive them. Here it's interesting because you receive the prophet in the name of a prophet, and the prophet is only the prophet because of the teaching that he carries. So it's out of deference to the teaching that you accept them. You receive a prophet because you want to be a nice guy, or you receive the prophet because your neighbors will notice how good of a guy you are, or whatever, you're not receiving the prophet in the name of the prophet because you're doing it for yourself. And this is why it's important to change the way that you think about what is glory and what is honor. You're doing it in the name of the prophet. And the same with the righteous man. You're receiving the righteous man in the name of a righteous person. So it's because of his righteousness, but righteousness on what basis? The teaching and that's what's most important, the reference point. It has to be because of the teaching that you're receiving them. You receive the prophet because he brings this teaching. And this then connects with the beginning part of the chapter. How do you present yourself when you go to the different villages and the different houses? And if they accept you, they're accepting your teaching. If they reject you, they're rejecting your teaching. Move on. Find a place where your teaching can be accepted. Receiving the person in the name of the person who brings the teaching is what's most important. And the reward you get, just like you're saying, Father, it's not a reward of this world because this teaching is not of this world. The glory and honor are not of this world. They're not the glory and the honor that the Roman authority or the synagogue authority can grant you. They're rewards that only God can grant you. And as we know, they're sometimes the worst possible earthly results, like the crucifixion, because you are respecting and honoring that teaching more than anything else. Look, it's really very simple. If you say the correct thing in your own name, it doesn't function as the correct thing. If you're saying it in your own name, it's self-righteous. If you're saying it in deference to the Lord and his instruction, you can be a total hypocrite and it's not self-righteous because the content controls your speech. But when you become self-referential, your hypocrisy becomes an agent for cruelty. We have a whole society of people who are very intelligent, who think they're saying the right thing and think they're taking the high road and their self-righteousness and their arrogance has resulted in the current political turmoil in the United States. Because not only do we recognize when someone is a hypocrite, but when they're self-referential, their words don't carry weight. You cannot speak on behalf of yourself. And this is almost, I think, impossible for Westerners to understand because they really believe in themselves as a God, as an individual, and they believe that everyone has to show their value instead of show deference to the source of value. And I think the word value is useful in an American context because we measure value in terms of cost, in terms of the dollar. And Matthew does the same, because the cost we're talking about is the price that was paid for our redemption from slavery and the price that will be extracted from us for the cause of the gospel. There is a price. And that's why we're now dealing with the question of reward. But the scriptural reward can't be redeemed in the market because it's in the heavens. Remember, it's the plural. Now, you try to convince me when any organization in this country is reporting its numbers to the market. You try to convince me that they could get away with saying the dividend is in the heavens. We didn't actually get revenue, but trust us, there's a revenue that we'll receive in the heavens. You'll be the laughing stock. 
because the way Matthew assesses value is fundamentally different. He's interested in what John will explain later is a kind of water that you can drink and never become thirsty again. He's interested in a currency that you can spend that will always multiply its value and that won't fade away when empires fall. That's why we're talking about the reward here in Matthew in the heavens. It's beyond the reach of the human being. And whoever, in the name of a disciple, gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly, I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Verse 42 is a classic biblical twist. Because we're talking about bearing witness to the teaching, bearing witness to the teaching, receiving a prophet, receiving a righteous man. But Matthew here does what Scripture always does. It boils it down to an incontrovertible example of mercy or cruelty. Because there isn't a person listening to this podcast who doesn't understand the importance of giving water to someone who's thirsty. Richard, you and I were talking earlier in English, it sounds like little ones means children, but it just means those who are insignificant or vulnerable or meek, those who are small in that sense, who aren't a reference in the Roman or Jewish hierarchy in late antiquity, the ones who are disposable or undesirable or insignificant. But the key in the example is that the judgment of this mashal in verse 42 is incontrovertible. The only way that you could see someone thirsty being refused water and justify yourself is if you have, as Paul says, blinders over your eyes, meaning that you're looking at either the text of Scripture or the example in life through the lens of your ideology, which makes it impossible for you to see the truth. And I love the fact, Rich, that the word ideology has the same root as the word idol, because that's exactly what would blind you from seeing the truth of this example, your worship of the false god you invent in your head. This is trying to establish the kingdom as opposed to your kingdom. It's establishing God's rule as opposed to your rule and the rule of your ideology. What I love about this is... It's both a strike against the disciple and the establishment of God's kingdom at the same time, because this is the end of Jesus's exhortation to the disciples. And his last word is if someone gives a cup of water to somebody insignificant, they're going to receive a reward because of what you taught them. The big shot disciple wants to go in and change everything and have everybody act differently and be able to see with their own eyes the change that they've affected. They want to make sure that they have a good Instagram channel so that they can show all the wonderful things that happen as a result of their work in order to build up their personal brand. That's what the modern disciple is like. But what Jesus is saying is that if someone simply gives a cup of water to someone who's in need, to one of these little ones, in the name of the disciple, they'll receive a reward. So most likely, the disciple isn't even going to see the fruit of their labor because simply giving a cup of water to someone else is worthy of a reward. Even more deeply, this is the subtle basis of the kingdom right here, where it's merely a person giving someone in need a cup of water when they're thirsty. This is the basis of the kingdom. You don't give a cup of water to somebody because they're prestigious, and you don't withhold water from somebody who lacks a way of paying you back. But simply because you heard this teaching of the kingdom, if you're going to be a citizen of this kingdom, then because of the teacher who brought you this teaching of the kingdom, you give a cup of water. And from that builds all the righteousness that's going to show loyalty to this kingdom and this king whose word comes through the disciple, which came from Jesus, which came from his father. The teaching establishes the kingdom through the mere sharing of a cup of water in the name of the teaching. And 
I hasten to add, if when you offer water to someone who's thirsty, oh, I don't know, Richard, say, for example, in the desert, and your government arrests you and puts you behind bars and puts you on trial, if that's what happens when you give the glass of water, in the eyes of the Gospel of Matthew, you've received your reward. That is the prophet's reward. That is the righteous man's reward. It is scorn. It is rejection. It is persecution. Because when the cross is on the line, doing what's commanded in verse 42, in the eyes of those who wear blinders, as St. Paul says, in their eyes, this person who does exactly what Jesus does in the gospel, is an enemy and a threat. This was the example, Richard, that you gave in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, and it really resonated with me. If we've come to a point when giving water to someone who is thirsty is worthy of arrest, is questionable and maybe even illegal, then the test of the kingdom is upon us. And I want to challenge our listeners not to become politically involved, because you can't bear witness to the kingdom by serving yet another temporary kingdom. This isn't about politics. This is about teaching and bearing witness. We have to teach and we have to serve. And we have to make every effort to remove the scales from people's eyes, to rip the blinders off to pour the gospel into their ear so that they can see the world not through the lens of their ideology, not through the lens of their religious belief or their political views, but through the lens of Matthew, through the lens of Mark, who sees the little one in the widow who gave her might at the temple, who sees in that simple and irrelevant gesture the majesty of the kingdom. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.